if you're watching this offline, thank you for watching this. Uh, I have no financial interest of or any financial relationship to anything I say in this presentation, but maybe I should have a declaration of emotional interest. I think every uh, programmer, developer uh, that develops their own tool, big or small that is, has always some uh, sentimental attachment to it. So I'm going to uh, talk about some things that I've developed. They will come across uh, much nicer than they actually is. Uh, I hope you will uh, understand and uh, believe that this comes from uh, passion and not any other interest. So when I was asked to do this presentation, I asked myself, uh, so what can I do? I can just uh, make a list of uh, tools that exist, and actually there are many, uh, so I decided not to do that. I will do a little bit of overview of uh, what is around, more like cherry picking a few examples. So if you're a developer and you have your own open source tool for muscle imaging and it's not mentioned here, I'm very sorry. Uh, it's not to diminish anything in your work, but just to give you a bit of examples of what is out there. But I also want to give a little bit more general introduction or more general idea of what uh, uh, development of open source tools means. Um, we're not too many, but uh, uh, can I see uh, if any of you is already a developer or programmer? Ah, there is a, okay, three, very good. Uh, so I assume that uh, the others are mostly users of tools uh, and um, this is, I hope there is a little bit of both in, uh, so some content for both of you. So just to uh, recap, everybody will probably know, uh, in neuromuscular disorders, uh, traditionally we've uh, relied on qualitative images, mostly STIR and uh, uh, T1 weighted imaging, uh, um, and these are also uh, contrasts that are used uh, in everyday muscle diagnosis. But uh, the uh, community has moved towards uh, more quantitative approaches, and usually we rely on fat fraction, uh, on water T2, and uh, of course also global T2 fitting, uh, and uh, very important are also muscle measures like volume, uh, surface area, and uh, then DTI is emerging, radiomics, so a very big field. So I cherry picked some examples, and uh, definitely we have uh, tools in the community to do water T2 fitting. Uh, we have uh, tools to do muscle measurements through uh, automated or semi-automated uh, segmentation pipelines. Uh, we definitely have tools uh, uh, to reconstruct DTI, and we will see that, but there are also general tools like MR tricks. Um, and uh, tools for fat fraction, really open tools for fat fractions, are mm, a bit an open question, uh, and there are something also about radiomics, um, probably something specific for the analysis of the rest is uh, probably not yet out there or not yet of interest to the community at the moment. But uh, why is it difficult to develop tools for muscle diseases? AI is uh, all the rage right now, so we want to have AI tools uh, uh, to segment, uh, to analyze, to classify, and so on. But uh, neuromuscular diseases uh, are each of one very rare. So as you see, if you take them collectively, they're actually quite a good prevalence, even before, um, more than Parkinson and multiple sclerosis, but each disease is different, and having an AI tool mostly to address each disease uh, separately, so to identify each disease is more complicated. Uh, on the other hand, uh, more on a technical note, uh, I also want to uh, introduce uh, with some concepts about uh, the development of open source research software. So why and how people uh, develop this open source software? So the first goal is because they want to be reproducible, and this is a very commendable goal. I want to make my pipeline open so that people can at least reproduce the figures of my paper. And this is probably where everything starts. Now we want uh, our science to be uh, trusted by our peers and we make things open so that they can see that actually the results that we obtain come from the data. Mm -hmm. And we release the code. But then we can uh, move one step further and make this a little bit more general uh, tool. And uh, this is a tool that you will start using in your own pipeline. So you will uh, uh, use it to make your analysis and produce the results for your next paper. And finally, uh, you are going to uh, solve a more general problem and say, look, this tool is quite good, this tool is quite good, so I'm going to release it to my uh, peers and uh, open it up for the community. 
But these are actually quite three different uh, attitudes, and uh, um, they come with uh, different requirements. So usually, uh, if someone wants to use the code that used to reproduce a paper, or maybe use for their own purposes, uh, you see that the user skill is high. So we expect people to be programmers, to be able to tinker the code, change it. Whereas if we want to solve a general problem, especially if we uh, are aiming for medical doctors, technologists, people who are not programmers, or not in the field, we need that this barrier of user skill to be low. Uh, the code organization can be relatively low. It can be just a list of instructions uh, in the uh, reproducibility code, but again, if you want it to release to the community, especially if it's open source, you have to start organizing your code so that people can actually understand it and contribute to it. This makes the cost of uh, releasing uh, a general software high, because cost in, general, in terms of hours and work that you put in, or even monetary costs. And uh, uh, one thing that is very important and sometimes overlooked is that the uh, flexibility of code that you release to the community is very low because you need to make sure that people can continue using the software without breaking it, be, uh, that it still works on their older data sets. So any improvement that you do is uh, when you do it disruptive, then you're going to make a lot of people unhappy. And uh, this is um, so everything that we have to keep in mind when we start in a project, of course, we usually start a project at this level, but if we want to transition to the other levels, we have to accept that there are some compromises and, of course, some advantages. And then, of course, you want the code to be used by people, and uh, you have to make it easy for them, because uh, uh, if you, people need to use a code, uh, need to use your tool, um, sometimes it's easier for them to just re-implement it because your tool will never solve exactly their problem. So you have to make things so that uh, your tool is flexible enough to solve other people's problem, or you have to make it so convenient that they're willing to accept compromises and uh, uh, start, use your code as a starting base for their, for their work. Otherwise, they will just go and do their own thing and maybe uh, they can get an extra publication out of it. So it's really important when you're developing and when you're uh, thinking of the end user that you also think of this scenario. Um, so this was the introduction. Um, let's have a look at this. I think I only took four examples from the community and maybe they're relevant to you, but most probably you already know them if, uh, if you're here following this. Um, we start with uh, uh, the tool more for nerds that are command line or uh, tools that are used in programming. And uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, probably the first tool that we need to address because uh, this is uh, Martin's Freling tool and for muscle analysis, this is definitely uh, everything you might need. It contains, uh, I, I'm not even doing a list of what it can do because it's just everything from DTI to fat fraction, water T2, you say this tool can do it. Um, it, is, uh, it has a complete documentation, it can work in cardiac. The drawback from my point of view, <laughs> and Marta knows it, is that it's written in Mathematica. And this can be quite a barrier. When we were talking about before that uh, people uh, need to overcome some burden to use your code. For me, who uh, I haven't used Mathematica since my university 20 years ago, uh, this is a significant uh, drawback. But it contains a lot of good things, so you have to weigh your options and uh, probably choose this. This is an, uh, um, an overview of how, uh, how it works. So this is Mathematica, in case you don't know, with these strange arrows that uh, appear magically when you type. Um, and this is uh, a T2 fit with uh, extended phase graphs for water T2. It has an inbuilt uh, viewer, uh, but what you have to write is this kind of code to start the T2 fitting. Um, Moving on, so uh, this is a tool implemented in Mathematica um, that works on a CPU. It takes quite some time. Some time ago, uh, our group uh, and myself uh, developed a faster version of uh, a specialized part of this uh, QMRI tool, which is just the uh, extended phase graph T2 fitting. And uh, uh, we decided to do a general Python implementation with CUDA acceleration. Um, and this is uh, a 
a usable tool. I have, we have collaborators that use it, but still uh, um, they uh, don't, uh, this tool I don't think it's ready really for complete prime time adoption because it requires some uh, compromises. My, mostly it's using the DICOM input as Siemens gives it. So if you use it with Philips data set, it might not work out of the box. It was not fully tested. Um, this is how you use it. It's a command line tool. It works best in Linux, but of course you have to fiddle, make sure that your drivers are correct. So this is uh, another example, another approach. The language is more common, but uh, uh, it also requires quite some uh, adaptation. And if you look at the code, there is a lot of Python and there is also a little bit of C++ uh, in terms of uh, CUDA code. Fat water construction is the other main, uh, main quantitative uh, biomarker that we are using. Personally, we are still using Fatty Riot, uh, which is uh, probably a fantastic algorithm, a bit slow, but it's also not completely open source. So it's uh, not something that I want to mostly focus on. Um, I don't use other tools, uh, but uh, the group of uh, Dimitris Karabinos uh, has released a lot of uh, general purpose uh, uh, water fat separation code in Python, and that's truly really open source. Uh, it works something like that. Uh, it still has a programming interface, so you need to use Python and uh, set some uh, parameters, load the images yourself. But it's very well done, and I hope I will use that in the future. Um, moving on to uh, user interface tools. Uh, one tool that exists, uh, these are tools that are more friendly towards the end user. And this is, uh, uh, the good thing is that more people can use it, but on the other hand, they are more monolithic, and they only do the things that they're intended to. Um, there is MuscleSense Workbench, and it looks like this. You can load the data, and it does water fat separation, and it also does automatic segmentation. It does reporting of muscle area and fat fraction. So um, I haven't used it personally, uh, but uh, uh, the, um, the, the team from the UK that is behind it uh, uh, is really open and willing to share it with everybody. Uh, there is a GitHub repository, and uh, if you're willing to do uh, this kind of analysis, so muscle volume and uh, fat fraction, this is a very interesting tool. And then, of course, I cannot not mention Daphne, which is my own tool. And uh, this is just a segmentation tool, initially started for uh, muscles. And the idea behind Daphne is that uh, we try to overcome the problem of data scarcity because uh, we thought that we cannot train a model on every possible pathology by ourselves because we don't have all the patients. So we said, okay, let's just crowdsource this. And the idea behind Daphne is that we have models that reside on a server and then every user that uses Daphne contributes to this model. So when you use it, you see you have this nice interface and you can use it to manually segment it, but you initially use an auto-segmentation to get uh, a, an initial segmentation, and then you can go and refine, for example, in this point where the muscle was not correctly identified. And once you refine it, uh, this is how it works, once you refine it, the model learns and uh, it gets sent back to the server so that your new knowledge uh, is uh, incorporated in the model without you having to share your data. Um, and then, of course, uh, you also get statistics, you get uh, a lot of nice things from Daphne. So if you are into uh, segmentation, not just muscle, now we can also extend to other, uh, to other uh, body parts thanks to a uh, very easy to use three-click model trainer. Uh, please give Daphne a go because this is uh, uh, really my baby. I designed the logo, I really like the logo. I have a sticker if you want a sticker afterwards. I would be happy to give one to you. Um, so as I just said, uh, uh, now we also have models for the abdomen and for the spine. Uh, we have a model uh, for the kidney that I'm going to release soon. And uh, you can get all these nice uh, uh, statistics uh, about area and volume and uh, uh, signal intensity. So you can use it for a lot of applications. And this was the overview of tools. And uh, I now want to talk to you a little bit about how to go forward. We have a few tools you've seen implemented in different languages, implemented in different contexts for different people. 
but how can we bring them together and make it really a toolbox for all the community to use? So we've been working uh, together with Martin and uh, a lot of other people in agreement with uh, um, a lot of members of the, our uh, muscle community on a common standard that is basically an extension of bids that can bring all these tools together. So this would be a common standard that can be read and can be written by every tool. And this is the proposal, our proposal, so that everybody can interchangeably go from one tool to the other and really create their own pipeline by daisy chaining all, this, um, all these tools. And uh, in a few words, the standard is just uh, a nifty file with a JSON header. And this is uh, uh, under a root patient folder, and then you have a data type subfolder. And uh, uh, you see here in the nifty, there is already the type of sequence that is used. And we have a basic header. And basically, this is the bid standard. Um, plus, we are adding some muscle-specific field in the JSON. And uh, we are also using a four-dimensional. It will be different than bids, but it's basically the same thing. In addition to this, we decided to uh, extract uh, the patient information into another JSON header and also put uh, uh, a lot of extra parameter if we have them from directly from the date com, from the DICOM to uh, into another header so that in principle we can go back to DICOM. So bids is not meant to go back to DICOM. We want other our uh, standard to go back because we think it's important that the images are seen again by the medical doctors inside their PAC system. So in principle you can do your um, your uh, analysis and then put it back in the packs. Um, and uh, this is not enough. Uh, you, need, you have a standard, but you also need to talk to people. And so what is important is also to have a community. And I'm happy that uh, the Ormer community, the uh, Open and Reproducible uh, Musculoskeletal Imaging Research community, it's called Ormir, uh, took over the muscle beads and uh, extended it also to other modalities like micro CT and uh, uh, also other areas like uh, uh, the knee analysis uh, and uh, uh, they forked the muscle beads uh, repository and they're making this the Ormir meets. Of course, I'm saying them, but we, because I'm also part of this community. And uh, uh, this is really a shout out. If you're interested in open and reproducible uh, muscle or musculoskeletal research, this is a fantastic community. It's relatively small, but we have people all over the world. And so you can uh, visit this website. And the, we would really like this to be a way of interconnecting the people that think alike. So to wrap up, uh, we have seen uh, various tools that are covering the most important use cases. There are lots of segmentation tools out there, open source as well. I didn't include them because usually they are tools to uh, made for one study to serve one purpose, but uh, of course uh, this doesn't mean that will not work for you, so look, for, look out for them if you want to try those. Uh, QMRI tools is the most comprehensive, but in my opinion also the most complex tool to use. And uh, what we are trying to do is now to bring all these tools together and put them into a coherent ecosystem. And this is an effort that cannot be done by just one single developer or one single research group, but it has to have a community behind it. The community doesn't have to be defined. It can be just people talking to each other, but I think it's easier if it's an established community. And uh, for this, I really found a good partnership with this uh, Ormir community that I encourage, uh, encourage you to explore. In general, uh, there is no separation between users and developers and uh, because in open source everybody contributes with their own skills and feedback is the most important uh, resource that we have. So I still have 17 seconds. I would like to thank uh, Wait, Serena questions? Bonaretti, Donny. Mm -hmm. hmm? oh, that's with questions. Ah, that's with questions. Ah, I was seeing this. So you have seven seconds for a question.